Welcome to Coming from Left Field, where we have conversations about politics, books, and current events with your host, Greg Gottles and Pat Cummings. In the late 80s, I would finish my week on Sunday night listening on an AM radio with a weak signal to a program, Alternative Radio, Howard Zinn, Noam Chomsky, Naomi Klein, Michael Moore, and Greg Pallast would educate me regarding politics. But the Marxist Michael Prenny often challenged my beliefs the most, exposing the darker myths of empire, the forms of tyranny that are so subtle, so deeply ingrained and controlling as not to be consciously experienced. Does Parenti still matter? I think so, and so does Eddie Smith, co-host of the Midwestern Marks podcast. Let's discuss. Warm greetings, everybody. We have a very special guest today, uh, Eddie Smith. Uh, thank you for joining us from Wisconsin, right, Eddie? Yep, or I'm right on the border of Wisconsin and Iowa, but... Wisconsin, yep. Wisconsin and Iowa, good. And uh, Eddie, uh, we are, you're a political scientist, you're um, uh, still a graduate student and uh, assistant wrestling coach for the uh, Pioneers at uh, Wisconsin uh, Platteville, and you're still, you're still studying, uh, doing graduate work, correct? Yep, yep, I'm getting a grad degree in healthcare administration right now, so. Good, and you are a... Um, I came across you through Midwest Mark's website, which wonderful website, uh, which your friend Carlos uh, Gerardo uh, also uh, contributes to. And uh, it's a, gosh, how many, how many subscribers do you have to that, Eddie? Um, it's hard to say with the website because uh, it, you know, varies, but we have like 22,000 on YouTube, I think. And uh, we're up to like 66,000 on TikTok now with our second account after our first one got banned. So, yeah. Well, there there you go. That That's what happens nowadays. I think you know that, right? So, yep. Yeah. And uh, you, um, you have uh, written a couple of things. Uh, one was this kind of a study of um, a Southern slavery and its relationship to uh, American capitalism and this uh, very good i think i'll link to this article eddie i really like this thank you uh you you took the work of um uh um baptiste uh, the which is the the half has never been told uh which is a book that when i first read it really impacted me and um it, it express a little bit about that article and the relationship between us understanding slavery as a, a blueprint for capitalism in our in our country. Sure, yeah, thank you. I'm glad that um, you like that. Um, yeah, I, I just happened to, I, I like to read um, a history book and a philosophy book simultaneously, usually, so I can go back and forth. And uh, what I happened to be reading that summer was The Half Has Never Been Told Alongside Marx's Capital. Um, and, and what Baptiste does really well in that book is analyze the economics of slavery, um, which, you know, obviously, as uh, Marxist or dialectical materialists, we see production or economics as sort of the base of society. Um, so I wanted to look at sort of the economic base um, of Southern slavery in the U.S. and how that interacted with capitalism in Europe and in the American North, which was developing at the time. Um, and a lot of the major manufacturing centers in, in Europe and then even the northern U.S. were textile mills or they were creating clothing. Um, so basically, they had an unlimited need for cotton. You know, there was they couldn't produce enough cotton. Um, it was almost impossible to produce as much cotton as they were going through or, or using to create profit with at that point. Um, so basically what the American South became was this giant um, cotton market uh, created by the slaves, which was um, super influential and super helpful uh, with the development of capitalism um, and especially these textile capitalists in the American North and in Europe. Um, so Marx is analyzing the rise of capitalism in Europe, and he talks quite a bit about, you know, how how they were benefiting from the the cotton market within American slavery. 
Um, but because slavery uh, came about in the U.S. South at the same time as capitalism or, or global capitalism, um, it sort of had had I mean, that had certain effects on how American slavery functioned. So it functioned a little different than slavery in the era of antiquity or like Roman slavery, you know, not to say those slaves uh, back then weren't oppressed. Um, but these the slaves in the American South had the influence of the capitalist market so that the more that the plantation oligarchy or the um, plantation owners, the more that they could get the slaves to work and the more cotton they could make, the more money they could make. There was basically no limit on it. Um, so it became this massive exercise in like developing torture techniques and um, just finding any way they could to uh, get get more cotton um, out of the fields and out of the slaves. Um, but it was also interesting. So it worked sort of like capitalism in that way. Um, but in the same way, it was different. So you had wage laborers um, in the American South alongside the slaves um, who were also ready for revolution and, and fought for the Union and the Civil War for the most part um, because they hated the plantation oligarchy um, and because the, the wage laborers had to sell their, their labor in competition with slave labor. Um, so capitalism and, and wage slavery is human labor commodified. You know, you sell your labor. But the idea of slavery is that the, the people, the human beings themselves are commodified. So I also looked at different ways, um, you know, that the, the slave class was, was sort of structured um, and how the, the slave slave owner relation worked um, compared to the, the wage labor capitalist relation. Um, so yeah, yeah, that was really fun to write I, it, they just basically use spreadsheets and torture to increase productivity even though the soil was depleting and uh it, it was it was shocking i mean i shared that with a couple of friends and we've chatted with that book it's it's uh an amazing book let let's talk about marxism i don't know you're the joe rogan of uh marxism you're just a young pup 20 something right yeah 25 oh, okay good and and Greg is the grand is the is the grand wizard. I don't know if you know, but Greg is a prolific writer in the field of Marxist Leninism. He's um, uh, I think uh, I would call him an expert scholar. And when we first started our podcast, uh, Greg sent me this book, um, Black Shirts and Reds. Black Shirts and Reds. And I, I think he did it because he was trying to be nice to me. I was a mid mid I was a, a MSNBC liberal, loved Rachel and uh, and so forth. Uh, Bernie bro, oh, I think yeah. you're a Bernie bro too. And um, and he was trying to to gently nudge me uh, to look at the world a little bit differently. And I think that book uh, helped me see um, Marxism differently. I don't know what's your relationship with that book. I want to chat with chat with you today about that book because I think it it's a good introduction to some of the concepts of, of Marxism yeah I couldn't agree more I have a um a, a video on our YouTube channel titled how to learn Marxism and it basically just gives people a step-by-step -step reading list and this is actually the first one I recommend um because it is good for people who are just starting out um and actually one of my viewers sent me a, a copy signed by Michael Parenti so Holy shout out to Andy for that I really appreciate it but <laughs> um yeah that was that was the first book that I read when I was getting into Marxism um one of my buddies uh was was also kind of helping out with the Bernie campaign um I would become an intern eventually with Bernie um but then at an event for Bernie Sanders he gave me his copy of Black Shirts and Reds um and he said read this and you know, the, the main bulwark, I think, or the main thing stopping Americans from uh, moving towards socialism or communism is the Red Scare McCarthyite propaganda. You know, you grow up being told by the media, by the education system and, you know, by your parents or whoever else that communism or socialism has always failed. And, you know, we've arrived at the best system, which is capitalism. Um, and what Parenti does in, in Black Shirts and Reds is show that, you know, to say that socialism has always failed is to ignore the fact that socialism worked for millions of people. Um, ignore the fact that socialism uh, brought illiteracy in the Soviet Union from like 17% to 99% in a matter of years. 
um, vastly increase healthcare access, industrialize the country, um, vastly increase access to education, build new schools, hospitals, and um, you know, to just look at that or to look at the successes of other socialist countries like Cuba or China or Venezuela and to just say this has failed, you know, throw our hands up in the air and say never try that again is completely absurd. Um, and that's what Parenti basically shows in this book. Um, and he does it by analyzing the Soviet Union and talking about anti-communist myths, but also then just going through World War II and giving sort of a dialectical analysis of it, talking about the economic conditions, uh, talking about production, um, talking about the different factions in Germany, you know, when like Germany almost went communist, um, but instead they they went towards fascism and, um, you know, leaders of the communist movement like Rosa Luxemburg were killed. Um, so Parenti shows the economics of what was going on in Germany or, or Italy or in these countries who um, went towards fascism. And what he finds is, you know, fascism is largely a way for the capitalist to act in a reactionary manner, suppress um, revolution or resistance from the working class in, in times of capitalist crisis. Um, so this is a totally different way than, you know, we're taught in the West to look at World War II. We're just taught, you know, you got Churchill um, and Stalin and Mussolini and Hitler, and they just all battled it out. You know, this great man of history fallacy. Um, but Parenti says, no, you know, look at all the economic conditions, look at the things that um, American academics overlook, you know, look at the way that American academics conflate Stalin and Hitler or communists and fascists when communists have been the ones fighting fascism every step of the way since day one. Um, so it just debunks a lot of the, the dogmas and the myths that um, Red Scare propaganda has put in all of our heads. Right. And, and the, the the black shirts are the fascists, the red shirt shirts are the socialists. And the, I, I, you know, this is a short book, uh, a couple hundred pages, but beginning with the inextricable relationship and symbiotic relationship between fascism and capitalism. Um, uh, that's the beginning of the book uh, and how we were, um, uh, you, you know how, how the two were were linked in, in in such a direct way. But the other thing that Parenti does, which I really like about this, is that he, he's he's not in a love affair with the Soviet Union. You know, he he has some really good criticisms. The one chapter he talks about their, you know, their press being not very functional, their productivity at time being bureaucratic and clumsy. The uh, he just goes down a checklist of, I think, what most people in the West would say these are some of the problems with the, uh, with the. Um... They, don't, they, they don't need to hear what's wrong with the Soviet Union. They hear that all the time in this country. That's the beauty of Parenti is that he gives you the other side. He gives you all the pluses. But uh, and that's why it didn't work. I mean, that's why he wasn't an academic. I mean, he didn't they couldn't get a, a job as a professor because of his politics and his and his his refusal to succumb to that uh, complete criticism of the Soviet Union and communism. The fact that he would not, that he would not uh, go along with everyone else, the whole anti-red tide um, is one of the reasons he couldn't get a job. And I think that's a measure really of his, of his, of his real importance. He's a popularizer and he didn't, didn't back away from these hard topics. There are few, there are a lot of windbag professors who are quote unquote Marxist. I won't mention names because it's kind of mean and unkind, but what separates them from Parenti is the fact that he didn't work. He had to make a living some other way, writing books and lecturing and so on, because he was just blacklisted, frankly. He was did, blacklisted. did you ever meet him, Al Greg? Baker was as well. The other great, great professor, uh, great, great teacher, an academic, or uh, not academic, but but um, a historian was, uh, was Herbert Apthaker who in relation to what, to what Eddie was talking about, he along with Du Bois were the first people to liberate this concept of, of, uh, of uh, uh, slaves as resistors, as fighting, as actually resisting, not just going along compliant in this great Magnolia South. Uh, it was Apthaker and, and Du Bois. Of course, neither were professors. Neither, neither were able to teach at any university in this country. Hey, Greg, did you ever meet Parenti? I have not. No, I did not per, uh, meet him. No, we've corresponded a couple of times briefly. I, I admire him. I, my admiration for him knows no bounds. I mean, really, he's just just a great figure and underappreciated. 
Right, right. Yeah, so, absolutely. I think that shows something important too. Like that's how academia enforces these anti-communist myths. Um, I know that was something hard for me to understand when I was in college, like all these professors who I looked up to and I thought were smart were anti-communist. And I was like, how would they all be wrong? But you can't get a job, you know, generally, unless you're anti-communist or it's getting better now. But um, when Parenti was writing, you know, you get blacklisted from academia um, if you say the wrong thing. So that's how they enforce that. And we had a conversation with Gabriel Rockhill a while back um, and he was analyzing sort of how the these sort of bourgeois academics, um, these sort of windbag pseudo Marxist professors that you're talking about, get these jobs. And it's because, you know, those are the only kind of Marxists who can have a career in academia. You know, you have to dogmatically dismiss any kind of existing socialism if you're going to talk about Marxism. Um, and yeah, I, I agree. That's why Parenti is is a hero. Yeah, he, he wrote it. Rocky wrote a brilliant paper on the uh, cultural Marxist, uh, in, you know, in Germany, the, the Frankfurt, so-called Frankfurt School. And uh, I, we'd love to have him on sometime. I think he'd be really terrific. But uh, the classic example is uh, Marcuse. Marcuse was celebrated in my era, in the 60s. I mean, my God, everybody read it. They carried in their book bags copies of Marcuse. They never read it, but they carried the copies of the book. And uh, he was the Marxist. Well, he had about as much to do with Marxism as, as uh, the man in the moon. So, I mean, the real authentic Marxists like Parenti are the ones that you can always, that's a good litmus test. If they can't get a job, they must be damn good. They must be <laughs> good. Well, and we've had on our podcast, Roger Karen. I think uh, he, he has done wonderful, wonderful work. Couldn't, you know, he was impacted by his writings and beliefs. I think he mentioned that on the podcast. Yes. And, and Tony Marano, uh, you know, is one of the leading scholars on Du Bois. He, he ran amok with Temple and uh, was, uh, you know, so I think you're absolutely right, uh, Eddie. You've got, um, you know, it, it's, it's uh, a target on your, your back if you, if you come out as um, professing that as your core philosophy. How, how did you make your transition from a just sort of a liberal Kyle Kalinske, socialist, to um, Marxist. What was the evolution that you went through? Yeah, I think it was good timing. So I was reading this book during the Bernie campaign as I was watching everything unfold, reading Black Shirts and Reds. Um, and, you know, watching the way that the DNC and the corporate media, who had so much power over the election, um, just watching them basically blatantly rig this election that we had worked so hard on. You know, it was in the middle of like wrestling season. I'm doing college wrestling, sports, and interning for Bernie, um, and and just trying to spend all my free time um, working for Bernie to you know change the the system and and change some of the worst effects of capitalism. Um, and and watching the way that all of the corporate candidates dropped out, you know, in order to endorse Biden. Um, and the way that uh, corporate media framed questions about Medicare for all during the debates as, you know, oh, you do you want socialist Cuban style, Fidel Castro style health care, you know, asking things like that to Bernie when, you know, Medicare for all is a half measure, you know, it's just uh, catching up to the rest of the developed world with what they've done with their health care systems. Um, and. You know, I just realized that it's going to take more than a Bernie Sanders. It's going to take more than a big, um, you know, one election to change capitalism or to change the system. And, you know, we have to learn how the system works, educate ourselves and attack the system at its roots. Um, and reading Black Shirts and Reds just made me, you know, it took that sort of dogma out of my head, this idea that communism has never failed. Um, and then then it was sort of a no brainer, especially as I started reading Marx's Capital. Then after that, I'm like, like, you know, if you're not a socialist, I think you're kind of crazy now. But um, I mean, not really, because everybody's indoctrinated with so much dogma. But, you know, once you realize that socialism hasn't failed um, and then you look at how socialist countries like China are doing compared to um, the, the liberal democracies, uh, these capitalist imperialist countries, I don't know. I think it's kind of obvious. But then also another big one I'll say was Lenin's imperialism, because I had studied um, political science, obviously. So I'm seeing how the U.S. is acting around the world. I'm like, 
you know, they're just evil. Um, but then I read Lenin's imperialism and he's like, no, you know, capitalism reaches its monopoly stage and the capitalists then have to go abroad and search for markets um, abroad. And I'm like, it, it basically just explained in a very simple way everything I had learned in my four years of studying political science. So that was a big one, too. Yeah, we recently discussed that book also and his relationship with the banks and, you know, he just... I mean, Marx and Lenin, all those folks, they weren't 100% all the time, but they certainly got the basic foundation of what's going on and the trajectory absolutely correct. And there's no doubt about that. Uh, you know, I I don't know about you, but as I look at Marxism, to me, it's, you know, it's it's not not a religion. It's just it's, it's just a way of seeing things. It's a way of filtering, a way of screening uh, uh What's going how on? How about with... it's a science, Pat? How about it's a, a science? Let's call it a science and see. You how think it's a science, it. Greg? I do. I think it's it is the social science. I mean, I I don't I don't know enough about physical sciences to say whether dialectical materialism or dialectic supply or whatever. But in the social sciences, there's nothing that compares to Marxism in terms of explanatory power. And I think that's what Eddie just said. I mean, when you when you read imperialism, you don't have to believe that. Every, every power under imperialism, those big eight countries that Lenin talks about are still the primary powers in, in imperialism. But you do have a scientific foundation for understanding that. And so you can apply it to today and you can do that with the political economy. Yeah, I mean, the workplace has changed and yeah, capitalist relations have changed and, and capitalism has evolved. It's not stagnant, it's not the same capitalism of. Of, of, of volume one, but the, but the science that is the underpinnings, the method is there to understand it, to explain. And, and my simple question would be, show me a better one. Show me a better one. We had uh, Joanna Moncrief on talking about uh, mental illness. I thought based on her Marxism, her understanding of Marxism, she was much more enlight enlightening than anybody else that I've ever, I've ever read. Because again, she looked at the foundations and Marxism provides that. It provides that as a science, I think. But hey, you differ? I mean, disagree? I agree 100%. I mean, that was my experience too, studying the social sciences. And, you know, politics is basically studying government and, you know, how the state works. Um, and there's been a whole lot written about that. And you can study the specifics of the inner workings of the state, but what you see is that it's basically controlled by the ruling class economically, um, you know, in any kind of class society. And that's what Marx was noticing in his method uh, a long time ago. Um, and, and like Greg was saying, you know, it's the, the method that's important. And it, it seems so enlightening after, you know, like after I left four years of studying politics and read Lenin's imperialism, because Marx has been so thoroughly extracted from most of academia. So we're studying the social sciences without seeing, you know, the, the connection between different things, or we're studying social sciences without looking at production as the base of society. And then, you know, sort of everything else stemming from that. So it sort of leaves you confused. It's sort of like looking at facts in a vacuum and you can learn a bunch of facts. Um, but then once you get the Marxist method, it sort of ties those facts together um, and allows you to see them as, you know, sort of cause and effect. And then um, the way that Gabriel Rockhill describes Marxism is one of my favorite uh, concise ways of explaining what it is that I've heard. And he calls it, you know, a living, breathing science or project, you know, for uh, bettering society or for bettering humanity. So, you know, the idea isn't that Marx just had it all figured out and he basically wrote the Bible. You know, he fit, he paid attention to things very closely. Um, he studied very closely um, and he did come up with some breakthroughs in in developing his method. But, you know, there are things that need to be tweaked. There are things that need to be critiqued. And most importantly, as Lenin does in imperialism, um, the analysis needs to be updated because capitalism is always changing. You know, that's one of the principles of, of dialectics is that things are always in constant motion or constant change. You know, so there will never be a point in the analysis of capitalism, you know, of the Marxist analysis of capitalism, where we just shrug our shoulders and say, OK, we got it all figured out now. 
Because even if we have it all figured out today, you know, tomorrow capitalism could change and, and develop some new um, elements that need to be analyzed further. Um, that's why, you know, so many Marxist thinkers have been building on on uh, Marx's capital and his other works for so many years. Right. Yeah, I, you know, the, the sequence, I think you said this on your show, Eddie, that you, uh, um, I, I've been listening to you a lot. I'm surprised at how good an educator you are in taking people to the point of understanding without preaching without you know you, you, you're it, it we can see your evolution as you're teaching and <laughs> that really comes through in a very very good way thank and, you and, and i remember the bottom uh, one of one of your shows you just said it it's just kind of simple it's just you have you have labor and you have the fruits of labor and the the benefits of that labor should fall to the people that do the labor and they should have a democratic understanding of how we would use those labors you know maybe for you know um uh roads or education or or, or so forth and that it should not be that the that labor increasingly gets uh, extracted to a smaller percentage of people to get wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. That's Marxism. That, that's it. I, it just, it's not complicated. It's rather simple. And I love your segment on Kyle Kalinske. I, I think you're on number seven now. You just did one yesterday that I had fun listening to. And and Kyle is a, Kyle's a good guy. You know, he he's, he's a He's a what justice Democrat and started some of those things. He loves golf. He's probably worth two million dollars now. Uh, you know, his, his capitalism has done well for him. And and you you do discussions where you play segments of his show and you say, here's where you are right, Kyle, but here is where you are wrong. And one of the recent one was on Met, Met, uh, Medicare for all, and uh, no, the insurance, the insurance industry, and government being able to. Um, negotiate insurance prices and you say you know yeah we we should and you're right about that and that's good but you're wrong because why aren't we just nationalizing the <laughs> pharmaceutical industry why do we need to have insurance industry and the pharmaceutical industry extract all of the value of capital to go to a small percentage of people that that's not complicated but for some reason all of these uh msnbc liberals miss that they miss that step am i am i right is that how you see it yeah i couldn't agree more i think they analyze the faults of capitalism pretty well um oftentimes you know kyle's pretty good when it comes to imperialism um criticizing u.s actions abroad um he hasn't been that good on the ukraine issue i don't think and criticizing what the u.s has done but usually he's pretty good and he criticizes government corruption and stuff like that but yeah his solutions um are always you know let's do medicare for all or let's do a ubi um and then he he's the founder of justice democrats uh which gave us aoc and and the squad um the idea was we'll just start primarying all the democrats and voting for non-corrupt candidates uh we'll get to basically social democracy um electorally by voting for people and i mean it hasn't worked at all we couldn't even get um aoc sort of the hero of the justice democrats to fight for medicare for all on the house floor um so I mean, just looking at things scientifically, like these sort of um, reformist strategies have always failed. Um, and the reforms that that Kyle talks about, he'll often point to FDR, say we need to go back to what FDR did. But what he's missing is that the reforms enacted under FDR were enacted because of class struggle. You know, they were enacted because there were a million card carrying communists and a bunch of wildcat strikes and the workers organized into unions, especially after the Depression, um, when they were realizing the crises of capitalism and the mal effects of capitalism. Um, so, you know, they basically forced FDR's hand. They basically forced him to go to uh, or to make social democratic reforms for the workers or face a rebellion. Um, and you know, then Kyle looks back on that and, and the social Democrats or the liberals look back on that and they say, you know, FDR gave us all these reforms. You know, no, the workers fought for these reforms and forced the, the government to give them to us. Um, and, and that's the path forward. You know, the path forward is getting as organized as possible, getting as educated as possible, 
um, and, and attacking capitalism at its foundations, not saying, please, Mr. Capitalist, can you give me a hundred dollars a month as UBI so I can continue consuming um, and continue keeping your profits um, as high as they need to be, which is basically what, you know, Kyle's ultimately advocating for. Right. Let me ask you a question, Eddie. I, I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, that's where we are, organizing uh, in a limited way, but mainly educating. I mean, we really have to overcome the ideological slump we're in. I mean, people just don't understand things uh, on the left. I mean, I'm talking about the left. That's why the left isn't growing and isn't more impactful. But my question then is, okay, we're, you're doing that. You're doing a marvelous, wonderful, beautiful job, particularly with young people. What's the next step after that? What's needed? What are some of the other factors that have to go into moving forward? Uh, of course, where I want to go and you want to go to socialism, but even to, to winning this battle uh, currently uh, for the hearts and minds of working people. Yes, I think people have to get educated and even more so than just watching like me is what I tell the audience is like, I need, you know, if we're really going to get somewhere, I need the members of my audience also reading, educating themselves, and then educating people in your life, you know, sort of spreading this education exponentially. Because like you said, I think that is the key right now. And as Parenti does in Black Shirts and Reds, overcoming this sort of big lie that socialism has always failed. Um, but then the, the two things I tell the audience is uh, workplace organizing, um, organize into unions, uh, educate your coworkers, um, cooperate with them, work on collective bargaining, um, and then community organizing, meaning things like mutual aid, uh, mutual aid combined with theoretical education, um, getting involved with the Socialist or Communist Party, and um, engaging in various political activities. Um, we need real working class organs of political power. Um, you know, the unions have been busted up and weakened and dismantled in the last 40 years of neoliberalism. Um, you know, and we need people involved in those unions using them and we need communists and socialists in those unions. That's another thing the U.S. has done is rooted out all the educated workers from these organs of working class power. Uh, we need to get people educated at the ground floor um, and, and build up these organs, whether it be a party um, or a, a workplace union um, that can actually fight for the working class. And we need to then, you know, then there are other things that come with that, like you have to fight opportunism within the union, you have to stay staunchly anti imperialist to make sure, you know, the unions don't say vote in favor of imperialism, because they think it'll bring more wealth to the workers. Um, and, and, you know, those are all problems that socialists have dealt with forever. But right now, we're not organized in the working class in the US doesn't even think of themselves as a class, really. Um, it's, we're so beaten over the head with liberal individualism. Um, and, and I think we need to, to develop real material, um, organs of worker power that, that allow the workers to not only, uh, do things and get active and fight back, but also just to see themselves as a class, as a class engaging in struggle against the, the ruling class. You know, I love to watch Fox news. Um, it's, it's better than Saturday night live, I think, as far as just general entertainment, but one of the things that you talk about on your program is that it is culture and these cultural diversions that are the smoke screen that keeps us looking to class. You know, you look at DeSantis, what is he all about? Uh, he, he is about uh, trans people reading books to your kindergartners. He's about, uh, you know, destroying the public education system through an you know attacking teachers he's all of these cultural issues not once will they mention the the feature of class and but the liberals don't either you know when you listen to when you listen to you know you'd expect that on i think fox news which is always done a kind of what's the matter with kansas thing of uh you know moving the ball um but um why do the why do the liberals contribute to that so much too? The MSNBCs, the CNNs, the um, never never class, never class, always culture. I don't know. What are you, what are your thoughts about that kind of wokeism run amok stuff? Yeah, I think it's. I mean, ultimately, it's just liberal individualism. Um, and Parenti talks about ABC journalism or ABC education, meaning anything but class. 
Um, and I think the reason that Fox um, and CNN or MSNBC don't mention class is because implicitly they know they're protecting the ruling class. They know they're protecting their donors, their advertisers, um, and, and their corporate owners. Um, and now they've sort of settled into this groove where they can keep people divided with identity politics and uh, race essentialist politics, which is something they've always done. You know, racism has always been a tool for dividing the working class. Um, but now it's just any any kind of, you know, cultural issues that can be used to divide uh, the workers they're going to use. Um, so, you know, the cable news is talking about this 24 hours a day. Um, while never, as you said, mentioning class because they are part of the ruling class that that we need to actually target and do something about if we're going to change our system. Um, and Hans George Muller is a philosopher. Uh, he's a German philosopher who's working in China now. Um, and he's done some really good YouTube videos and written some books about wokeism. Um, and the way he describes it is basically focusing on identity politics or cultural issues at the expense of focusing on class, um, which ironically prevents the actual liberation of oppressed identity groups because you're not actually changing anything materially. You know, we're just arguing. So then he also does another video called The Mirror of Wokeism. So you have, you know, the leftists or, or not the leftists, but the liberals pushing this uh, woke ideology that's just focus on identity politics and culture um, and never, ever talk about class. So then you have the DeSantis's and the Jordan Peterson's and the Matt Walsh's of the world who act as a mirror of wokeism. Um, so they'll criticize identity politics all day long, fight the culture war, talk about how crazy the liberals are in terms of what they want um, for social policies, while never actually advocating for doing anything for the working class. I mean, DeSantis is the perfect example. At least Trump was like a pseudo populist. At least Trump, you know, said he was going to help the working class and end the wars. You know, he didn't, but he got a lot of people in the Midwest to vote for him for that reason. DeSantis is just a pure culture warrior. Um, and of course, what the people in Florida actually need is class struggle or uh, they need to be organized or they need health care. They, you know, there's a lot of homeless people in Florida, all these material things that DeSantis has never talked about in his life um, because he can be real popular and be a celebrity and keep the whole working mass divided by just fighting these cultural issues. Um, and yeah, I think it's become something that we we need to talk about as Marxists. And it's something I've been talking about more. And you have to be careful, you know, not to be not to be like offensive or come off as a reactionary, you know, not saying I'm against uh, social progress and progress in terms of these uh, social issues. Um, but we have to recognize that it's absolutely being used um, as a way to distract from class struggle. Uh, we mentioned this last time in our podcast, Greg, um, the site called, uh, are you familiar with the site called uh, WTF happened in 1971? What, I'm not. Okay, I'll, I'll put a link to it. If you just do WTF happened in 1971. And it shows you, you know, 1971, I'm in college, Greg's in grad school. It's, you know, it, it, it shows you all of the economic factors through charts that have happened from 1971 to present. And no matter what indicator you look at, the, uh, you know, income going to the 1%, the loss of unions, uh, two families having to work to make ends meet, the cost of health care, the 30, 40 different charts. It just shows you there is a trajectory that is god awful horrible. And it's all of the things that are electing Trump. <laughs> and and in and if you've gone through the Midwest, you live in the Midwest, uh, you know, that uh, the devastation that's happened in the economy of the Midwest. And not one, th those are never discussed. Those are never discussed. It's either the polling or the Trump or the, I, I, it's all of these other issues but not the real issues that are the underlying problem that's occurring to m most of our country that's driving this attention Mar to- Mar Marxists have, Marxists have been in the forefront. I mean, in fact, they've been the leader in the struggle against racism. Communists have been the leading force in the United States against 
racism, historically. I mean, without a doubt, it's not even questionable. The history of the Communist Party is a history of fighting racism. Uh, communists pioneered in the late 40s. Uh, African-American women communists pioneered uh, the women question and, and developed that. So it's not a question of either or, which some people present it as, it's very dangerous. What it is, is injecting class into all these questions. All these questions have a class aspect and this intersectionality concept as the academics use it is a denial of that. It's to say, class is over here, women's issues are here, race is over here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's really, really a tragedy because Marxism and communism can be such a contributing factor to all of these oppressions in this country, we have a deeper and more profound understanding of them. So we have, but we have to be careful in negotiating that because uh, you guys, both of you are right, cor absolutely correct in terms of how this is being used as a weapon uh, against, against any uh, deeper, more profound, and worst of all, unity. You know, unity uh, of, uh, between all these oppressions. So that's... Um, yeah, and, and class is the factor that ties all those groups together. Like, uh, I know the transgender community disproportionately faces homelessness. Um, uh, Adolph Reed has written about how uh, Black people are disproportionately targeted by the police, um, but also poor people are, you know, and the uh, poverty is the number one factor you can use to tell, uh, or that, that yeah, you can use to tell uh, who police are going to target. Um, so if you demilitarize the police and attack the prison industrial complex, yes, it, you know, disproportionately helps the black community, but because, because class is universal, you know, and, and class ties us all together, uh, that also helps everybody else. Um, and, or, you know, nationalizing housing and giving universal housing to people disproportionately helps the trans community, but it helps everybody. So that's the source of our unity. And that's why we base ourselves in class, not because we don't care about oppressed groups, but because class is the key, you know, class is the key to actually fighting against oppression. Um, and it's the key to, as you said, unifying all these uh, various groups and various struggles. So are you, you, you said you're getting your degree in health medicine. Are you still doing any academics at all um, with your other writing? Or is that just on the side with your um, political writing and such? Yeah, I stay pretty busy. I mean, it's hard to find time between the videos, um, you know, writing and uh, doing grad school. But um I definitely read every day some philosophy or history. Um, and then this summer, I've been writing a lot of actually been working on a, a book that I think we're going to publish about Venezuela and U.S. imperialism in Venezuela. So I'm trying to get that done before school starts, but it will be something I work on on the side while I'm doing school. Yeah. Well, our next podcast, tell them about our next podcast, uh, Greg, with Dan. Oh, yeah. Dan Kovalik. Uh, Dan's a prolific writer, in several books. He was at the inauguration in Colombia, the Petro inauguration in Colombia uh, this past uh, week. And he's really terrible. He's a Pittsburgh person like I am, so I know him well. And he's uh, all excited about that. He's got a new book coming on uh, Nicaragua. And of course, you may know his earlier book on Venezuela, which was uh, uh, written, I think, last year. So uh, we're excited about having him on uh, next week as well. We'll be excited about talking about your book when your book is available too, as well. So it's, yeah. uh, when do you expect that to be published? Um, it's hard to say right now because uh, I'm still working on the first draft and just finished the outline and gathering most of my sources. But um, I would say three months um, is a good timeline, depending on how busy I get. But it could be sooner than that too what are, what are your what are you you're looking at what we're looking at we're looking at a a, a mess a friggin mess in the united states I mean, we're looking at you know economic disaster i mean the notion of um of a crisis applies in every area of our lives today uh, from the pandemic through the economy politics the two-party system and so on what what do you what do you see what do you see coming what do you see you know, you're a Marxist. Tell us what a Marxist <laughs> would see coming. 
but uh, what, where, where you're are a, you're, you're a Midwest Marxist. You're not an East Coast elite Marxist. You're a Midwest Marxist. No. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, my hope is that the the world is not only moving towards multipolarity, you know, and, and less U.S. Uh, hegemony and U.S. global dominance, uh, but I I think you know the world is also moving towards socialism because of course you know imperialism is rooted in capitalism so really the only way to fight imperialism is by moving towards socialism nationalizing um, uh, various industries that are controlled by multinationals getting off the U.S. dominated global financial system which is largely what China's Belt and Road Initiative is about um, so I think we're seeing a global move towards that. Um, but I think eventually, I mean, not eventually, it's already happening, but that's going to trigger more and more economic crises here um, in the U.S. Because the people running our country will, you know, push us into nuclear war or, you know, complete devastation before they give up their wealth, before they give up their empire. You know, they're willing to sacrifice anything. Um, so I think the key you know, is to get organized and, and move our country towards socialism, um, because it's the only thing that can, you know, save our people from experiencing deepening um, and worsening economic crises and political crises, um, and really devolving into something um, much worse. Uh, but I mean, the way I approach it then is just, I mean, it is kind of corny, but I take it from wrestling. Uh, you just take everything one day at a time, you know, you can't, like, we, we do want to have our long term goals in mind. Um, but ultimately, if we sit around and, and worry and think about our long term goals nonstop, rather than focusing on the work that needs to be done right now, um, it can distract you from doing that work that needs to be done right now. And then, um, you know, you might look back a year or I don't know, the later you start actually doing the work, um, the less work that gets done, you know, so it, it's good to just focus one day at a time. Um, and, and that's what I do. Like every day I wake up, what can I do? You know, today, obviously, I have my personal responsibilities, but then what can I do today to educate people and help people get organized? Um, this is kind of what I try and ask every day. And I don't know, I, I honestly think if, if most of our country um, gets educated and, um, and, and gets organized, like we've got a good chance to, to move towards socialism because people, people are getting fed up with the system in, in just about every way. You know, you've got hockey in Minnesota and lacrosse in um, New York and wrestling in the Midwest. I, I, Greg and I both grew up in central Illinois and uh, we would have more people at wrestling matches than we would at basketball matches. You know, <laughs> people don't realize how big wrestling was. I, I was a good but not great high school wrestler, went on to regionals a couple of times, um, walked on to wrestle uh, at college until I got my ass kicked for like three weeks straight and realized this was some sort of, you know, sexual maskist uh, activity rather than athleticism because the guy, I felt like a boy wrestling with men at that level when you, when you get to that level. Uh, are you still wrestling now or are you just coaching? Um, yeah, I actually have been lucky enough to compete at the senior level which is like uh, beyond college trying to make the world olympic championship so i qualified for the the world team trials in greco-roman wrestling last year so that's what i'm doing now as far as competing so you're still working out and doing your doing a lot of road work and so forth yep yep okay. yep that's one what other thing i gotta fit into my schedule yeah. What are, what are you reading, Eddie? What are you reading? What should we be reading? Um, right now I am reading. Uh, Carlos gave me Hegel's lectures on the history of philosophy. Um, oh, so wow. That is <laughs> dense. <laughs> I'm on page forty-four of that, but it's it's very, it's a great read. I mean, it's enlightening. Um, it's sort of you know, Marx based a lot of his work off of Hegel. So it's almost sort of like going back in time um, to pre-Marx um, and seeing what Marx built his theory off of. So it's been helpful. And then I'm also reading uh, Parenthes, um, The Assassination of Julius Caesar, oh, uh, yeah, People's yeah. History of Rome. Yeah. That's the next one I want to knock off. Uh, that'll be that'll be interesting. Yeah. Where I was I, telling I, Pat a, a story uh, before we were on about Parenti. Uh, I went to the University of Illinois and I graduated a year before, but in 1970, the spring of 1970 was a big mobilization and 
quite quite a lot of action in, in the in the in the uh, anti-war movement. And right after uh, um, Kent State, uh, the, the the murder in Kent, the murder of the four students in Kent State, and Parenti was on the University of Illinois campus. I, I I didn't know that he was a visiting professor, and he was a leader. He was the actual vocal leader of the movements, and he got beat up by the uh, Illinois State Police. And uh, he stayed right in there and he spoke the next day through his injuries. So he wasn't just an academic. And that's what I think really separates him and why he's one of my idols. I mean, I really, wow. I we have to encourage everybody to read everything that Parenti wrote. Yeah, and I, I came across him first on uh, alternative radio. Bar what was that station? They'd have Sunday night, they'd do a lecture of Chomsky, uh, Michael Moore, Tariq Ali, uh, you know, all of that, but uh, Prenti always seemed to have such good insight. He, he just looked at everything differently. And, and this book was 25 years old, six years after the uh, fall of the Soviet, of the, the wall. And it is so accurate in outlining the trajectory of what was going to happen when you lost the socialism in the Soviet Union. And and the disparity of the, the it's, it's, it was a horror show after the wall fell down. I mean, it wasn't you know great before, but it certainly deteriorated everybody's living standards and, and inequity of um, of wealth and um, just a destruction. And uh, he predicted that just within a few years after the fall of the Soviet Union, he's still not you know there's a lot of things that he's off base on a little bit. Uh, you know, he's not you know a perfect predictor, but uh, it holds up so well as just a foundation of how to see the world and how to see the struggle. Um, and yeah. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I think at one point, maybe Parenti mentions that he is a Marxist or using Marx's method in this book. But one of the things that I love about him is he basically does Marxist dialectical materialist analysis, uses Marx's method to look at history without saying that's what he's doing you know he's not um he's not necessarily being like using the traditional marxist vocabulary all the time um he's not talking about marx on every page of his book he's just using dialectical materialism to look at history and then like you said it produces these histories that hold up that are that are incredible um so it's the the use of that method um i think that makes him such a strong historian and you know, that I think is the proof of the value in Marx's method, too. Right, right. So what happened to your TikTok? I mean, what's the story? I think we heard it from Carlos, but uh, Barry's... You were, you, were a, you were a bad boy, I hear. Uh, somehow you're yeah, a bad you're, boy. You're, you're subversive. I, well, <laughs> I guess so, yeah. I'd, uh, I mean, I had gotten taken down, or we had gotten taken down a few times, and that account was up to um, 375,000 followers when we got taken <laughs> down. So we were teaching a lot of people about Marxism. Um, and then when the quote-unquote SOS Cuba protests happened, which was basically a U.S. color revolution attempt in Cuba, I was saying the truth, saying that it was a U.S. color revolution attempt, and um, we kept getting taken down. Um, and we were getting just flooded with comments, negative comments like never before. Um, and then later, you know, Cuba, uh, maybe it was from the Cuban government. I don't know. But um, someone published a report that the U.S. was the U.S. State Department was using some company, um, some technology company to create bot accounts and to influence social media. So I imagine they mass reported us. And um, there's evidence of similar things going on um, now with Ukraine. Um, and that's what led to the permanent ban. As soon as Russia um, entered Ukraine, um, I started talking about the 2014 U.S.-backed coup in Ukraine, the ongoing war in the Donbass, the Azov Battalion, all the different things that the U.S. and NATO have done in this region to help, you know, make this conflict happen. Um, and we got attacked like never before. I've never seen anything like it. The amount of like bot accounts, or they had to be some bot accounts, some were real, I'm sure. Um, and then our account got permanently banned at that time. Uh, and we now know that TikTok has been hiring former NATO operatives uh, as their content managers. Um, this company called Oracle, who owns TikTok in California. Um, so I guess literal NATO operatives uh, were the ones deciding whether we got banned or not. So that did not work out well in our favor. 
Well, well look at uh, Jackson Hinkle, his account being taken down, uh, the gray zone. I don't know how, I, you know, they pushed back heavily against the Guardian and finally got the Guardian to back off a little bit about um, uh, their their work, uh, calling them radical conspiracy theorists or something like that. And they, uh, you know, pushed back. They've been doing really good work. Um you know, so many of these people that are trying to get information out are getting attacked. Monk John and Mark Cree, who was the psychiatrist that we had on last time, got a horrible hit job in Rolling Stone, you know, portraying her as this, who is the psychiatrist that the radical right has fallen in love with, you know, just absurd stuff. So I don't know. It it what's interesting today, I don't know if you followed the CDC, but they came out and fell on their sword uh, today with a very extensive article about how they 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 kind of screwed the pooch with all of the COVID response. They no acknowledged way. they acknowledged mistakes, they acknowledged the mendacity of the mask rule, they acknowledged that they had information long before and withheld it, that their messaging was horrible, that they um you know, how many people lost their uh, YouTube uh, and Twitter because of that? <laughs> you know? Right. You know, just some, it, it, uh, anyway, it's it's a hot mess, but um, it's good. Freedom of speech. Here. We have freedom of speech. What are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Both of you are subversives. Yeah. <laughs> it's a country have, where freedom of speech. So, Eddie, have you followed much of Greg's writing and his blog and um, his work on Marxist Leninist today and that that? Okay. No, I haven't, but I am very excited to check it out okay, after I'll we uh, that, get off here. I'll send that to you. We we both we recently did. read this uh, wonderful book. We can't get the author on. We'll try to we'll try it again. Uh, the rise and fall of neoliberalism order, and Greg mm -hmm. wrote a wonderful uh, book review of this. Uh, the the thesis being that the you know we need to look at politics not so much from uh, election cycles but from these longer trends and again the neoliberalism back in the WTF 1971 you know just just talked about this steady uh, progression of problems created by neoliberalism and his his theory is that you know Trump might have kind of you know broken things up a bit because of his his craziness is uh, making it so it isn't as, as strong a cohesive uh, a force. I don't know. Well, he's, he's not a Marxist, but what he does say is that Trump is a reflection of the cracking up of uh, the so-called neoliberal order. You know, he sees it in terms, as a Marxist would, in terms of the conditions that created Trump, not in terms of, oh, he's an evil man. And of course he is, but that what's that got to do with anything? So this guy, Gerstel, really... Again, he's not a Marxist, but he, he steals some of the methodology and he talks about how neoliberalism arose. So he puts some meat on what's been kind of spare bones in the past in terms of understanding neoliberalism. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's worth a read. It's, it's, it, it's, it reflects well on what's going on and gives us insights into what's going on. Good. Now, but, I would uh, love to check that out because, I mean, there's been a severe lack of Marxist analysis of Trump, you know, I think the Trump derangement syndrome is actually a good word to describe it, where people are more concerned with the individual than the conditions that created him. Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up in, uh, you may know, downstate Illinois, I, I go back there, my sister lives there now, uh, south of Danville, it was an industrial area, it's a working class area, I grew up in that area, and to see the changes, the devastation, and of course, Trump signs are everywhere, but you kind of understand people are looking for an answer. I mean, my God, people are working at General Motors in an auto foundry and making good money. My entire street, everybody but the few coal miners on the street, my family, we're all General Motors employees making terrific money, high school education. And that's all gone. It's all disappeared. And so now there are slot machines and a prison and and, and, and then, then liberals, uh, East Coast liberals wonder why Trump wrote. Well, they don't wonder. They just say he's a bad guy. Right. But that's right. that's the story. I'm sorry. You, you, you see it, I'm sure, in Wisconsin, too. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, the great meltdown uh, by David Sirota probably did a better job explaining Trump than anything. And that was, you know, post uh, post the, the financial crash, how how people's lives were devastated. And um and no one really talks about that. They, you know, they 
talk about P tapes or other more exciting things. So <laughs> there we go. Hey, Eddie, keep up the good fight. Um, and I'll, uh, you know, that you've got somebody out on the um, Tacoma area that enjoys your enjoys your show and listens to it a lot. And I wish you luck and and Carlos, our buddy too. Um, and I, I just hope you keep uh, keep going. So. Thank you so much. This was an awesome discussion. So thanks for the invite. Good, good. All right. Mm -hmm.